left, right. Yo, what is up? Thank you for watching. If this is your first time, enjoy. Let us know at the end what you think. If you don't make it all the way through, sorry about that. Uh, but if this is not your first time you watched this before, you owe me a like, you owe me a comment on this one. I will see you on the other end. This is Sip Talk. Grab a drink and enjoy. Let's go. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Here we are. It's you and me, mono e mono, and some crazy allergies. This is episode 99 of Sip Talk. My name is Justin DiGiulio out of New York City, joined by James the Bosnator Boswell out of Charleston, South Carolina. James, your many expertise include being a philosopher, an accountant, a referee, and a bartender. Yeah, you're seeing the signs of the refereeing right now. Uh, still <laughs> you, shaking off a, a whole bunch of sun from the weekend. You are bright red. Um, I am super stuffed up. So if you caught, as we were just logging online tonight, I... Mowed, I raced home today to mow the lawn because I was away last week and uh, the lawn's getting pretty high. And, uh, you know, man, the amount of times that you need to mow the lawn every summer, if you do it every two weeks, like that's about, it's been about a week and two days uh, since I mowed the lawn and it's getting high. And then I mowed it and everything's brown. So, and it was you guys nice. not and, getting any rain or what? I, I don't know. It, it seemed a little wet in places. It rained when we were gone and, uh, I don't know. I don't know how people keep their, their lawns super bright green. I'm going to have to do some Googling on that. Um, and uh, we're getting we're getting notice here that we're still not live on Facebook. It may not happen. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, I almost flipped over. I got this little riding mower and uh, <laughs> just cruising around at, uh, I don't know, about seven miles an hour, probably uh, around the around the lawn in this this riding mower. But man, oh man, the allergies, the, the pollen is, is crazy. The mower was yellow. It was orange. It's a red mower. It had, uh, uh, had pollen all over it. Did you, uh, you buy yourself a mower yet in, in Charleston? Yeah, we've got, um, a battery powered push mower. It takes about maybe 30 to 45 minutes of pushing it around to mow the whole lawn. So it's not too bad. Ooh, you got it. So it came with the house or you went and you bought one? Um, it was a housewarming gift from my father. Very nice. Very nice. Is it, uh, Ryobi? No, no. Oh shit! Um, I'm thinking about uh, <laughs> my buddy who works at Home Depot. Um, sometimes he works in returns, and he told me he's like the only brand that I see consistently come back for returns is Ryobi. Wild, huh? It's like every other brand, it's like here and there once or twice, but Ryobi all the time. Hmm. So what did you? What did you end up going with? I don't even know. I wasn't the one who picked it out. Casey went out with my dad and he came back with a lawnmower. I was like, all right, cool. We got a lawnmower. <laughs> it works. And the battery holds enough charge that it's at about 25% after doing the whole lawn, which is fine. That's perfect. Yeah. Lawn's not getting any bigger. So that's, so that's good. Um, and we're it, thinking about conquesting one of the neighbors, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, I'm trying to figure out ways I could make this lawn smaller. Um, but it's you know the, the tough part is it's by so a whole I'm, bunch of rocks turn into like a rock garden or whatever <clears throat> nothing will grow well i'm thinking about paving a, a larger portions about an acre wide and just putting like a tennis court or a basketball court on it i think that would be i think that'd be efficient use of space if i'm paving the driveway i, I just you know put it's some not cheap though dude it's not cheap at all i'm looking at paving the driveway and that's not that's not a cheap endeavor either um but the idea of having to mow less is is cool. Uh, it, when we were talking about home ownership, this is one of the things I really we I think we may have touched on, but it's not something that we really dug into. Just how much yard work, uh, and you're bright red from playing soccer. I was out. Uh, I was out for probably somewhere between like seven and eight hours in the sun over the weekend. Yeah, good for you. A little vitamin D, a little sunburn, never hurt anybody. Yeah, it wasn't the, feeling too short great term. yesterday. It's 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 wearing <laughs> off now. So, um, all right. So, what uh, what are you drinking over there? I'm doing a bourbon and bitters. 
and the good old fashioned bush ice, which has just become like my brand. No, I, I, I like that. I like that. I'm about to do a little uh, tequila and soda, a little ledger line here. Um, but while uh, while I'm making this, we know Rosh is. So if you guys are watching us live, we have Rosh, who is monitoring the live streams, feeding us your comments, your questions. So we're here for those. Rosh himself is drinking, and I might add a very classy, good-looking drink, good-looking cocktail. He's got a mint julep, and he's got it in a in a mule glass. Which is that appropriate? Um, yeah, uh, like a copper cup is traditional. The copper cup. So he's got this nice copper uh, glassware that he's using, copperware. Um, but while I'm making this, I'm putting this one together. Do you want to go? Because you crit- before we got on air, we were talking about the drinks. You criticized Rosh a little bit about how he was making the drinks. So I'm just curious from a bartender. This is Sip Talk. What's the best way, start to finish, to go about making a mint julep? So mint juleps, a lot of recipes call for you adding water to the drink. I think that's a big mistake. The, the trick to making a proper mint julep is having the ice crushed at like the right consistency. You don't want too big of ice cubes because then they won't melt down enough. Too small ice cubes and your drink will be watery. So you want to have like your ice crushed just the right amount. And it's not something I can easily demonstrate here, but like you want to have it, I would say like not pebble ice, but like maybe ice that's about average size of like dime to nickel sized ice. Okay, so so dime to nickel size ice cubes. I um, usually see the really tiny ones, and and I I don't like those because they, they melt down too fast. They melt too fast, and I feel like you don't get enough liquid in the drink, right? Yeah, at first, and then and then it's just all water towards the end. So yeah, and you want to have a little bit of variation. You don't want them all the same size. You want some ice to melt down a little bit quicker, so it waters down the drink, and then some ice that's bigger cubes, so just to keep it cold without melting too much. But whatever the case is. You're gonna have two. Chi- you're gonna have your two tins, and in one tin you're gonna have the ice loaded. The other you're gonna have the the mint and the sugar, um, and just use granulated sugar. And you're gonna take a muddler, and you're just going to kind of shake up the i um, the sugar so that way it coats the mint leaves in all in all directions. And take the muddler and just very lightly muddle the mint. Um, you're not you you're want- not crushing the mint. You're not just no. okay. I, I would have thought the opposite. No, you don't want to crush the mint because the, the thing is a mint julep shouldn't have texture to it. You don't want to have You're little chewing pieces on the mint of mint leaves. in it. Yeah. Uh, you want uh, to, uh, all you want to do is get the sugar to bite into the leaves a little bit to release the oil of the mint because that's where all the flavor is. So just kind of bruise the mint with the, with the sugar and then take that and then put that on top of the ice. Then you're just going to take your bourbon and probably like a five or a six count at least pour the bourbon over the sugar and the mint. And now the bourbon is going to start dissolving the sugar a little bit and then just cap it, shake it really hard. You almost want like the shaker tins to frost a little bit on the outside. Uh, and then just once, once you've got like uh, just a light frost on the outside of the shakers, take the entire mess and just pour it into a tin. And then if you want, you can add like another mint sprig as a garnish. Just as a garnish. Just leave- Yep, but leave yeah. everything in there. Don't strain it. Keep the ice that you used in the shaker as part of your drink because it's already started to melt down a little bit. Uh, so we got a comment on uh, Instagram. I think are we allowed to drink too? If you're watching us, that's the idea. That's why. Yeah, that's why we drink with us. That's why we record at the time that we do because we want the questions to get uh, inter- interesting. Uh, hi, Tori. The, we want the questions interesting. I was pretty blitzed the, the last episode. Um, <laughs> it's been a long day in the sun, a long day uh, of drinking, and then a happy hour right before. No, uh, no mowing the lawn before. So, uh, but either way, thank you for uh, for that. Now, let me just ask: if you substituted rum instead, and you add in lime, w- would that be a mojito? Pretty close. What would the be the difference? Would be, um, technique? No, because um, you're going to use a similar technique where you're going to take the sugar and the lime and the mint, and you're going to bottle that all together in the bottom of one shaker and then put it on top of the ice in the other shaker. Um, But what you're also going to want to do is with a mojito, you're topping it off with soda water. You do not want to do that with a julep. Uh, And probably different. You wouldn't use a small ice cubes. 
Huh? You wouldn't want to um, use a small ice cube. Yeah, with mojitos, you don't have to worry about it watering down, so you want to use big ice cubes with the mojito. All right, all right, cool. You know, I, I, I thought I love lime and I love, uh, I love mint. I thought I would love the mojito, and it's just, it's never, it's never been one of my top ranked drinks at all, which is really disappointing for the me. Mojito? Yeah, it's never Why been not? one of my. I don't. It's just, I don't know. It's not, uh, not crazy about it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have to experiment a little bit once, uh. I get this bar up and running over here. How's your bar going over there? Uh, my bar's great. <laughs> you, but yet we're still not recording from there. Well, Even that's because fi- the lighting's weird. And like, I've got my computer set up and everything here. I would have to like unplug my webcam or run it off of my laptop, which I usually leave at the office. And also like the bar's all mirrored. Yeah. So it's, like, yeah it there's cool, just though. big backlighting issues. Like, and also the bar height, you're gonna have like the camera pointed up at me, which is gonna yeah, look. Yeah, well, we got we got we we got what we got now. Um, it's gonna work. I like the boxes are still adding up in the background, um, but <laughs> I like you just checked and you're like, yeah, yeah, they they definitely are. Um, Looks like the people are commenting that uh, I'm pretty right about these drinks. You are. Well, that's what you know. That's that's one of the four elements you bring to the table uh, as a professional bartender. So, which is more than what I bring to the table. Uh, I'm not a philosopher, nor am I a bartender, uh, nor a referee. I don't like following rules. Uh, But what I wanted to start off talking about today was I heard in a couple of different occasions during the day today that people are having a difficult time hiring. I saw a Facebook group, this guy's advertising 300 bucks a day, and he's advertising in groups where people are, are like complaining about being unemployed. Uh, to like basically do labor you know, he needs some some not super skilled labor but um, but somebody who can you know do some work and put paint on a wall basically and nobody's even responding to his ads at 300 bucks a day and he's like that's you know at minimum 75 grand a year um, you know with time off that's not a, not a bad gig but nobody's uh, nobody's responding and then on the news in the ride home, there was a report on NPR about how uh, they're really struggling with factories and manufacturing that nobody wants these jobs and nobody's applying for these jobs, which just goes to show you that when you have half the country on extended unemployment, people just get lazy and they don't want to work. Um, I think that's a reductionist argument. It, it may be here. You got to excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm dying. I can't, I can barely talk here. That's gross. I'll find a way to mute myself. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we've been but, trying for a while. <laughs> it's, uh, I think w- people, uh, the point is, I think a lot of people don't want to work. And if there's another way they can get money without having to work, they're going to do it. And if unemployment's out there, they're, they're going to remain on unemployment as long as possible. And that also coincides with today. I saw the eviction moratorium, at least in New York. I don't know about the rest of the country. The eviction moratorium was extended. Um, the eviction moratorium was extended another until August, the end of August, which to me is insane because my thinking is we're like, what, 15 months into this thing? Ballpark. Right? Yeah, roughly 15 months. I'd say early middle March of last year. Like technically the first case was in like early February or late January, but it didn't really actually start impacting things until I'd say first or second week of March. Economically, economically mostly is what I'm getting at. But we have people who, here was my thinking. And I've, I've been on this roller coaster ride of, uh, owning a business that is expensive to run in midtown Manhattan. Uh, and, it, and by roller coaster, I mean, it was a pretty steep des- descent and we're, we're still on the, on the decline here. But well, that's uh, the fun part of a roller coaster. Yeah, well, I suppose I'm not much of a roller coaster guy, but, and I don't, so I, you know, it's I'm, better I'm, when you can feel the wind in your hair, I'm keeping the office open. And I've had some ups and downs in running this business over the last five years, six years. Um, it's, you know, my goal is to keep the office open and operational and running and keep 
we keep it operational so that other people can make money as well. Because I know if they can make money, ultimately as the business owner, it works out for me. But my focus can't be on me. It needs to be on allowing other people to make money. But if you're in a job where you haven't been working for 15 months, an extra three months of an extension isn't really going to save you. I think you know, at, at the 15 month mark, that's a really good indicator of the three or five year mark. Like you're, you're probably not, you know, if, if, if you're trying to ride this out, uh, it, I, I don't know. I just think a lot of people are, are not making moves. But uh, eviction, eviction moratorium is not rent forgiveness. So what even do you when think the is moratorium happen? is lifted, aren't these people going to have massive bills for back rent that they can't afford? Yes, but think about how the eviction, what, what do you think is going to happen when the floodgates open? How are the courts going to handle that? What precedents are, are going to be set in the court system? Oh, everybody, just, everybody just instantly owes 15 months worth of rent. How does that, you know, who comes in with a sob story, which is the same as everybody else's? You're not, it's the argument that so, something needs to be done is it's not always the best argument. I, you know, I'll agree that something needs to be done in this case. But doing something for the sake of doing anything isn't, you know, I don't think in a, in a, in a, another, I'm not saying the eviction moratorium is a bad thing, but the eviction moratorium alone, I think is, is what's very frustrating for me because there's still, nothing's going to change over the next three months. People are just going to get back on their feet in the next three months and then they're going to back pay 15 months, 16, 17 months worth of rent. Well, there is an argument that there's going to be a change in the next three months because you're seeing that most, if not all of the states are going to be relaxing pretty much all their restrictions within the next three months. So there is going to be probably a significant portion of the workforce that's going to be able to get like whatever amount of people that aren't working right now, there's probably a good number of them that are going to be able to resume work in the next three months because the states are removing all restrictions. Oh, yeah, almost all restrictions. Um, I was just on a packed flight, um, which, you know, I, I get really frustrated on these flights where, like, I'm just jam packed in the back and, you know, would have cost me another 60 or 80 or 200 bucks to fly up front, especially when, when like, you're coming home and you're already, like, you're over the trip and you just want to be home and then you just jam packed. There must have been 35 babies on this plane. The babies were just crying the entire flight. Um, and I was just jam packed with two people. I didn't know seated right beside me. Uh, it was, it was really, really frustrating, but in a huge contrast to the last few flights I've been on over the last few months where there's been very few people on the plane, you know, we just flipped the switch and now the floodgates are open and everybody's flying. It just, Yet they had to wear masks that people had around their chin when they handed out snacks and beverages. Yeah, there's a lot of stupid aspects to do things right now. Like I flew in October, and basically from the moment I walked into the airport, I was just like, "This is stupid." But but that's my point is you we have these rules that just the argument that you have to do something, so doing anything counts as something, and and then you're good is, you know, how do you jam pack people that um, nine inches from the person in front of me, nine inches from the person uh, behind me and seated, touching the person next to me. And you have this you know, snack car comes by, people got their masks down, people are eating. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I heard vaccinated I, uh, yet. What's that? You've been vaccinated yet? No, but I've been taking my allergy pills lately. So I figure get, I got that. that get vaccinated. I'm going to ask you this every single time until you get vaccinated. And I want chat. I want everybody in chat to harass Justin about getting vaccinated as well. Well, if you work with me, you know, you haven't also been vaccinated. Let's go together. I think that, that we can hold hands. And you, I'm not good with this healthcare stuff. I, I haven't had healthcare in so long. So the, the um, vaccine doesn't cost anything. I get that. So, but it's not something I'm, you know, regular checkups and things like that. That's not like on my, I don't, I, I don't even really grocery shop. So it's, I just kind of run from one thing to the next. And if there's an opening, I just do the shit that uh, there's been building up that needs to be done. Um, you know, so it's like, 
finding time to to do this i don't know i agree I don't, you know I, so you, let's get back to the topic on hand which is like finding people like so you're going to be coming at this from the perspective of a business owner i'm going to be coming at this from the perspective of an employee but also someone who does consulting work for a number of business owners okay um so in its most simple terms, you have to look at this like any other market inefficiency in economic terms, which is you have the supply and demand. And so the supply of labor right now is arguably low. The right. demand for labor is increasing. A year ago, the, the demand for labor was super low because all these businesses were closed. So sure. demand for labor cratered. And... Now demand is starting to creep back up as businesses reopen. And there's also a lot of pent up demand in various industries of people that haven't been able to do anything for the last year. Now they want to do everything. And so all these people that have just been cooped up want to go out and buy things or do things. So you've got businesses that were shut down now experiencing a surge in demand. So demand for labor is way up. Supply at best has stayed the same. And so... But you have all these people that are out of work. So how, how has the supply of labor stayed the same? There should be people that are ready to go. We have all. I'm. 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 Parts of these Facebook groups where everybody's complaining that they're not working and they don't have jobs, so they can't pay rent. Okay, but like, and, what's the, yeah, the and I'm also part of labor. Of, you've got. I my my, you know, I, I think what really hit me today was that. I was doing some trolling around on Facebook and, you know, I have friends from all over the place. I have people complaining about illegals taking jobs. And then I have people complaining that they can't find labor. And that, yeah. You know, well, sounds- so basically to continue with the economic analysis here, it's supply and demand. So if supply is low and demand is high, not naturally what you would expect would be price would go up. So the price of labor would have to go up. What are you, what are you saying? The, the wages? Yes, that's that's what I mean by price of labor. Okay. Well, I mean they are basically going up everywhere. But what's your what's your greater point? Well, to I, I look at people who, if you are having trouble finding people working your job, the job that you want people to work, then you need to pay more. People will take any job if you pay enough. Sure, but I don't think these jobs, I think $75,000 a year for basic day labor seems pretty reasonable to me. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, sure, maybe. But obviously, if people aren't taking $300 for, for a day's worth of work, then there, there's something missing in the equation. Yeah, I don't know I've- what it is. I don't either. I'm just reading the the top line headlines there. So, which shame on me for for that. Uh, yeah, like what is he asking people to do? What? Yeah, I just don't get it. Because to me, it sounds like three hundred dollars an hour would be good enough. But if uh, not three hundred dollars an hour, three hundred dollars a day. I mean, that sounds like a decent amount of money, especially for someone. You know, he's not asking for a college education. He's not asking for a master's. You know. Yeah. So. Um, so we got Maria who got both shots in the comments. Congrats, Maria. Um, but uh, oh, there's a good comment. Rosh is probably picking it up right now. How I'm a good candidate for the Johnson and Johnson because it's only one shot, which would probably be the one that I would I would go with. Um, you know, is that is that still available or they, yeah, they yeah, shut they, it all? They put they it only back shut on? it down for like a week and a half or so. Do you get to choose which one you get or it's just kind of? luck of the draw there no i think basically you can look at the um places that are offering vaccines and they'll tell you which type they're offering um i wasn't going to be picky when i had the opportunity to vaccine be like screw it i'll go whatever and it just happened to be pfizer which all right fine um yeah but i'm sure that you can look up in new york city and see the vaccination sites and see which ones are offering which yeah, I will. Uh, well, hopefully somebody who's, who's listening to us will uh, will touch on that. 
A couple other things I want to talk about. Uh, one I'll ease into, but it was an issue that happened in the office while I was gone, which is very frustrating uh, because it shouldn't ever have happened. Um, and uh, also, did you see this picture of the Bidens with uh, the Carters? No. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Biden looks like a giant. He literally looks like Shaquille O'Neal kneeled down, kneeled down alongside Carter. It's, it's really so wild. Blondes have more have more fun. Says people are hiring like crazy around here, but people who are receiving unemployment are making more staying at home. Well, so this gets into the economic question of incentives. So you need to set unemployment at such a level that people can at least be able to pay their basic bills off of it to some degree, but, but it's not all, it, high enough that it disincentivizes people from seeking work. But it may not be that they're making more on unemployment. They're just making more for doing nothing. So the work well, output I mean, is if zero. If you're making anything for doing nothing, then you're making more. Yeah, but the work out, you know, the work output is zero and, there, and, there's, a, and there's income. So that's, there's a fine line to draw there. But I imagine a lot more people were making more on unemployment than they were making with their jobs. I don't know how that adds up but i feel like i know some real estate agents that were making a pretty steady because money fluctuates in real estate uh but a pretty steady income over what are normally our slower months and uh you know some of them may have been making more than they would have on a monthly basis via unemployment uh through being a lousy real estate agent but again well, that's lousy real I, estate i'm agent. still i'm gonna have to call it like this 300 dollars a day and this guy <laughs> saying that he can't hire anybody I'm, I'm gonna have to call bullshit on that that there's there's no way like there, there there's either something glaringly wrong with the type of work that he's asking for or whatever or he's saying that he's offered 300 dollars a day and he's really not because like 300 dollars a day is more than i make in the office for an eight-hour shift yeah, but so I don't know. Maybe I'll maybe I'll have to look it back up and and do some digging on that. Uh, so look, let me let me share with you a little bit of what happened because again, the you, you got to do something. Argument is where I'm falling right now. Like I feel like I need to do something. I don't exactly know what to do. I feel like I have a pretty good grip, pretty good grasp on things normally. But since we've let go of the staff and we don't, you know, I'm not as involved because I'm doing all the day to day duties that the staff used to do, I can't be as involved with what's going on, on the floor. And it's frustrating for me because there's petty bullshit stuff where I have people throwing like their tuna salad containers into our recycling bin, which gets changed like once a month. Um, and I'm just like, are you fucking retarded? Because I, I don't want to, you know, go. It doesn't even have a bag in it because the bag always rips because people put. Uh, it's not recycling like for plastic. It says paper printer paper only on it recycling, and it's by the printer. But for whatever reason, people put, put a topper shit. on it that has a slot. Oh, good one. That's a good idea. I'll see if I can. How pass. easy? Yeah. Well, that's you, it. But you, my point is, I, I don't want to. You be know where I live. You can send the royalty checks. <laughs> I don't want to be the fucking garbage police and like busting people's balls every every time they put the wrong thing in the garbage. There's like so much bullshit that like pushing in chairs in the conference room. I walk by the conference room and there's shit all over the table and chairs pushed out. And I have to walk around like I'm policing a fourth grade classroom be like, you know, hey, Jimmy, we push in our chairs when we're done sitting. And it's it's it makes me really frustrated to have to be this bad guy. When and, and it just makes me want to kick people in the teeth all the time. So institute an office wide fine policy and have the money that goes into the fines be paid out as a bonus at the end of every month to somebody. But I can't. So that way, I can't track down who does it. You've got cameras, don't you? Not on all the chairs. I, I've been trying to track down the person that uh, that's been putting their shit in the garbage can. I can't figure out who it is. They're in the recycling. I'm, I want to figure out who it is. And, and uh, you know, but whatever, we'll we'll get there. Here's here's what happened. I don't even know how it happened, and I'm sure I probably don't have all the details. Tell the but story. Somebody was talking about like Mario Kart or one of these one of these things about uh, a video game with the Mario characters, and they turned to one of the agents 
who is black and said something along the lines of, oh, well, you, I know what character you would be. You would be the female Donkey Kong. And uh, that probably was, wasn't meant to be racist. No, and I, and I, and I, I'm sure it wasn't. I know it wasn't. I was told by the other part, the party who said it, I didn't mean it. And I, and I apologize once I found out that's how, but then the person I imagine during that time, the person's like, yo man, that's mad racist. You can't say that stuff. And, uh, but they, it just perpetuated. And then the, and then the agent quit and another agent who witnessed the thing quit, not the offender, but Why'd the witness quit. Because they didn't want to be in an environment that that happens. They're also a person of color. Uh, and and there's a couple of other reasons. But that was supposedly what put them over the edge. Very frustrating for me. But also, we have a very eclectic, very culturally diverse, racially diverse office. I always thought that was cool. It's not something we've done intentionally. Uh, it's, you know, for me, it's kind of, just part of being in New York city, you would put the job ads out there and people reply. And, you know, most of them like what they see in the office, uh, just in terms of the office culture and they want to join the team. But, uh, but having a racial issue in the office is not something I, I am cool with. And I'm not exactly sure. How did how to, you handle it? Well, the agents told me that they, uh, that they were leaving and uh so they, you didn't hear about this until they told you that they were leaving exactly exactly they told me they were leaving and uh, i met with one the other one sent me an email and it, literally outlining everything that it was and uh i had a short conversation with uh, the other person before they left for the day and I haven't had a better opportunity to talk about it. And again, I'm not naming names and not pointing any fingers, especially in a public setting like this. But it's a, it's a greater conversation that needs to happen. And it probably needs to happen on that individual level and then on a broader scale at the office. And there's, there's a lot of times in the office where I hear people just talking shit and saying stories and non-work related stuff. And again... I hate being the bad guy and walk in and be like, guys, what are you doing talking about your weekend? You're here to do work because you don't want to be that guy. But it gets to a certain point where you're just constantly hearing people cracking up and laughing and you just want to be like, well, how much money did you make last month? Maybe you should put your nose on a computer. Maybe you should go out and, and do this. Maybe you should call some clients. Maybe you should do this. Um, and I don't, and I don't want the only interaction that I have with agents to be that. But unfortunately, there's more opportunity for me in that respect than there is in patting people on the back and saying, you know, give me a high five. Um, which I actually today, uh, I'll tell you what I've done so far today. I, I move my desk setting into the center of the office so I can kind of monitor things a little bit more. Um, and also a, a big reason is that I can be there for people when they need help. And I just see people sitting there struggling or somebody take a phone call that doesn't go well. Uh, but, on the admin end of things, I don't get a, a lot done. I noticed today. Uh, there's a lot of distractions out there. But what are your thoughts? Because, uh, you know, obviously we're two white dudes talking about r racism in an office setting. But well, I, I, I can understand why the agents would have quit. I feel like they should have come to you first and talked to you and said, hey, this just happened. We need you to. We, we want your input. We want to know what your response is. The owner of the business is like, because it, it would be one thing if you said it, but you didn't, it was one of your agents. And before you had a chance to talk to the agent or maybe even get the three of them together and say, Hey, let's talk about this one together. So we can like, so you can express why you found that so offensive and you can realize what you did why it was wrong but let me let me well, first off it's really difficult to grab a black person and put them in front of the offending white person and have them explain racism because one it's uncomfortable for the person that was the, uh, the victim um and i use that loosely but 
because again, it also it, it goes in the face of me saying uh, things like people got to toughen up and people got to be more tolerant. Because I don't, I, you know, I think this is a, a rather lower level offense in the sense that it wasn't. But that's what a lot of fucking racism is: is that it's not. It, it wasn't intended. It wasn't intended to come off as racist or come off as superior or you know or as condescending. But it does. And yeah. people don't realize that. And that's, you know, and I think uh, there was a comment here uh, about uh, diversity training uh, that came through TikTok. And I think that's a good one. Um, but it's really, it's a tricky subject to broach with a lot of people. Um so you know, I think I think there. Sh- I, I, I'm planning on releasing a statement. Uh, you know, just kind of a, a couple general things. But uh, I don't know what else. What else is on your mind in terms of a response to that? Um, my roommate told a good story about how I think he was in elementary school. How a teacher um, demonstrated privilege to people because. It's something where if you are in a position of privilege, you don't see it because you've never not been in privilege. And so um, the exercise was the teacher put their garbage can on their desk and, you know, their, their desk is in the front of the classroom and some kids sit in front, some kids sit in back. Right. Mm-hmm. And the teacher says, okay, for the next assignment, I want everyone to take out a piece of paper, wad it up into a ball and everyone who's able to, from their sitting position, throw the ball of paper into my garbage can, gets an A. Anyone who misses gets an F. So naturally, the kids that are in the front of the classroom are going to have a much easier shot than the kid that's all the way in the back. And so yeah. the kids in the back are like, yo, this, is, this isn't fair. Like, it's a harder shot for us to take. And the, the teacher's like, okay, so let's think about privilege. The people in front have an easier time doing this it's the same task everyone has the same chance to do it but for some people it's much harder because of the position that they're in and when you're in front you don't think about how difficult it is for the people in the back to make that shot but the people in the back that's all that i can think about is seeing the person in the front having to make a two-foot shot and i have to make a 20-foot shot yeah yeah i i think that's uh a really good way to describe systemic racism and to contextualize racism. Uh, you know, I, I like that. I like that teaching method better than where everybody lines up on a line and then certain people get to step. You, you ever seen, there's like a YouTube video, maybe I'm thinking of, where he says, you know, if you're if you're white or if you have this or if you have this, take a step forward. If you have this, take a step forward. If you have this, take a step forward. And then ultimately, it's a race to whatever line. You see, I don't like that because it automatically assumes that some like some people are privileged over others. So like, if you're white, you're privileged. No, like this is one where you want to take race and everything out of it yeah, by having that's... it by the seating of wherever you choose to sit having that be your privilege and it's basically luck of the draw as to whether you wanted to sit in the front or the back. That way everyone can see, hey, this wasn't something that I had any control over but now I'm in the middle of the classroom and people are in front of me and they've got an easier time. It's it's a way to remove race and whatever class yeah, no, or I, that's why I like, from it. I, I like the one that this your roommate's teacher gave uh, much much better. Here's and Cheryl just brought this up uh, this is I put a video out yesterday, and this is the con- the too brief of conversation that I had with the offending agent. <clears throat> and to the comments about me being sick, no, I'm not sick. I have terrible allergies, and I just mowed the lawn, uh, so that was fun. It's gonna be a fun night. Um, what I told him was, it doesn't matter how you meant it. What matters is how it was perceived. And you have to understand, especially in the society we have today, is that it doesn't matter what you want to say. What matters is when, when your words leave your mouth, they no longer belong to you. They belong to the people whom they fall upon. And you need to be ready for the consequences of 
of those words. And it, again, it doesn't matter what you wanted to say or what you should have said or you know what you thought you said. It matters what the people perceived it as. Um, you know that was. But again, when it comes to the race racial stuff, like just it, it's difficult to even have a conversation about it where a, a lot of people it just doesn't sink in because the awareness isn't there. And they think that because they didn't mean harm by it, no harm was done. But, you know, nobody, especially somebody who's not part of that conversation, didn't initiate the conversation, doesn't want to be dragged into a conversation. Um, and then compared to Donkey Kong, like, fucking A, man. Uh, a very frustrating one for me. Uh, I'm... <sighs> I, I don't know. Like, it, that's tough because I feel for you because you didn't even have a chance to react to it. Yeah, well, and, and but apparently, you know, there's other there's other things that have happened in the past, and a lot of times this stuff builds up, and and uh, you know, it's been brought to my attention other times that the culture in a particular part of the office isn't great, and, it's, and my my solution to that was, well, let's remove you from that culture, um, and. Sometimes that might have been inadequate. You might have needed to say, "Hey, guys, here's a problem that's been well, brought not to a, my attention." Not, not a not a racial issue with the culture. More of a work ethic issue with the culture. And what was working against the work ethic was just conversation that was not related to real estate. Da 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 da. A, a million other things. Um, all right, I got to think about this one a little bit more. But if you guys are watching, uh, oh, there's a nice comment on. Uh, TikTok. Let me just hit some comments on TikTok real quick because they're coming in. Let's see. White workers have often spoken racism in my resent. Present presence, probably. R E S E N T, but said not aimed at me. Uh, unintentional. You can make a statement to reiterate the culture of the company. Uh, maybe start the diversity meeting with a team. Were they upset with me? Uh, and then more talk about vaccines. No, I don't think they were upset with me, but they just wish it didn't happen. And uh, you know, nobody. It it should not have happened, and I, I wish it didn't happen. And uh, figure out. Uh, well, and I think another thing that that white people don't notice, and this this actually happened on Sunday night with me. Um, I'm still white. I was white Sunday night too, but um, I had soccer games on Sunday, and one of the guys I've wor- I was working with is a Jamaican guy that I've been friends with for like ten years. So after the games, I said, "You got to come by, check out my new house, have a beer with me." So he's like, okay. "All right, sure." So he drives and he parks in my driveway. And um, we're in the driveway talking for a minute or two before we go into the house. And um, there's a guy who lives in the neighborhood who's walking out front. He says hi and he introduces himself to me. And he asks my Jamaican friend if he lives here. And he and he's like, oh, yeah, you could be like a quarterback or whatever. I was like, okay. why? Was, and, he, was he a built guy? Was he was he in good shape? Um, I mean, he's. No, like he, he's in average shape, but I was just like, why, why, are you, why, why would you say that? And like, I immediately felt awkward because it just made me feel like he wasn't welcome. And yeah, yeah. and but just and, but- and so like that's something where, as a white dude, I never experienced that. But those small remarks or whatever, black people go through that every single day. Yeah. And, and my yeah. buddy who's Jamaican, he's been around long enough to know like how to shrug it off and he's just kind of gotten used to it. But it doesn't make it right. Yeah, and I think you know when there's an opportunity to uh you know to shift culture a little bit with a little or a lot of pushback, a lot of people are gonna get behind that movement, which is kind of what we have happening now. But it's something where like the guy on the street probably didn't even realize that he was being racist. No. But I want to, there's some thinking I, I want to work out in my mind about just kind of how we are, how we're, tri- we're a tribal species and that we're inclined 
I got to work this out in my brain as to what's the benefits nowadays to being in a group and to noticing differences in others and how we're evolving away from that and how it's going to look in a hundred years or 150 years, because, you know, now we're not segregated by different land masses, you know, and, and, and by water. And it's very, you know, people are sleeping with everybody and, and, well, you know, think the, about the it from an evolutionary biology perspective. When, when people, when the human race was developing or whatever, you grew up in small groups as like hunter gatherers, somewhat nomadic or whatever. So the people that were part of your group of like either a family or like a small nomadic tribe or whatever, you all looked the same. So yeah. your brain kind of evolved to recognize that anyone who doesn't look like me, because you know that the other people that are, you look like the people that are around you. So when you see someone that doesn't look like the people are around you, like evolutionarily, they were more likely to be a threat than someone of your own group. Yeah. yeah. And, and that threat is minimalized now. To, but to well, the extent. threat itself is no longer there. Like we shouldn't be seeing people that don't look like us like threats, but the biological structures in the brain don't just change in the, in a hundred years. So we evolved this response. But, but, but the issue, but my, but I, I want to figure out what I want to spend some time thinking around is the idea that you can't turn that off. So how do you, how do you deal with it? Like, well, it, it comes from exposure where, I definitely think the exposure thing is a huge, that's a, that's a very good point. Sorry, go ahead. I mean, yeah, it comes from exposure and education. Yeah, I think the exposure one is, is really a huge one. And that's I'd say it's like 80, 20 exposure education. I, this is something I'm moving into New York city and you just, you experience all these different cultures and people, people that look pretty different than you, but you all have so much in common. Um, and really, usually the biggest differences are just you guys have different tasting foods, like really, you know, and that and that's a sure. aspect of it. But uh, but really, for the most part, there's not that much different between what everybody's kind of striving for in life. And, uh, you know, and you're all occupying the same space. But but that thing that happens in your head when you see somebody different and the inclinations that you have. Like there's got to be something, you know. There's there's got to be you know some way to deal with that. And and well, the other problem is portrayal in the media, which I know gets a bad rap, but there's there's a point to be made here, which is when news coverage only covers one particular race a certain way, or when movies only portray a certain race a certain way, then. If you watch a single news show or a single movie, that's one time. But if there's a pattern where every single movie has similar portrayals of a certain race or whatever, over time, that exposure, even though you're not being exposed to that people directly, that exposure is going to lead you to have conceptions of, of what those people are like, even though you haven't ever met them. And there, there's a lot of criticism of the media that's invalid i think this is a valid one where when news covers like a black crime differently than it covers a white crime well no when, you have black crimes then you have crimes is usually how it's portrayed maybe yeah that, but I mean, even even what you just said uh, yeah that furthers my point which is like when when black people are made to appear more dangerous in the media then again one time happening, not a big deal. But when it happens consistently, and that's all you're exposed to, then you start to build in your head this picture of black people being dangerous, when in reality, crime statistics bear kind of the opposite. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's true. Um, man, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to perpetuate the conversation around around race. It's well. But, I mean, yeah, as I said a number of times, this might as well, this podcast should just be called like two white dudes talking about topics they have no business addressing. But, I, you know, I do think sometimes it's good that we talk about this stuff. I, I mean, I definitely know sometimes it's good that we talk about this stuff. Um, 
but sometimes I just hate having those conversations. I'm bringing it up today because it came up. Um, we talked it's a little good bit. To get of, people thinking about it, though. It, well, there's, but that's again what I want to bring my reasoning around. Like you know, when I when I see cake or something that looks really good, like I have a reaction inside of me. I'm like, fuck, I want to eat that. Um, but then I have to think about it. I'm like, no, I don't think I will, or I'll, I'll stop there. There's all these kind of lizard brain things that happen. And some of them are really difficult. And, and I think that's a lot where it lies is somewhere in that lizard brain. Uh, you know, you have these instinctual immediate reactions when it's, you know, the kind of the first impression thing, like, you're judging a book by its cover. Like, yeah, you, you know, you know, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but if it looks like a boring ass book, you're probably not going to read it. You know, it, well, I mean, I, I think that's a terrible phrase because why do books have covers in the first place is to draw attention to themselves. Yeah, so, exactly. Like, but that's my, it's, it's a it's, false analogy. It's the lizard brain. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the lizard brain reaction. What do you know what, what the actual name for the lizard brain is the part of the brain? I don't it's know. not the frontal cortex. That's like the most advanced part of the brain. But but it's it's a part of the brain that we all have, and it's your immediate reaction part of your brain, and it serves some great purposes. Um, but you know, I used to argue with people when when they'd like pretend to punch you and they'd be like, oh, "I made you flinch." I'm like, "Yeah, because they're a fist." Because that's what you face. do. Like, if I didn't flinch, I'd just be retarded. Like, you have this reaction. Like, I'm gonna go with it, and one of these times, you're gonna get hit back, probably. But what you should do is when they do that, immediately go back like that, and then they flinch. You'd be like, see? Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. Um, so how but, about we don't play this game anymore? <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're bigger than you, then then I don't know. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you do just punch them and run uh, and uh, claim it's your fight or flight. Uh, Miss Blaze says it's the limbic system, which I think, yeah, there, there's something there. Yeah. We'll have to do some research. I, I should ask my mom because she knows all the parts of the brain. <laughs> Yeah, she would. She she definitely would. Um, let me ask you though, to to make a quick uh, quick turn here. What else is going on? Any current events in uh, in Charleston? No, man, my head's still buried in the sand. Well, not sand, um, paper. But you're still so it's still accounting season. Um, they they extended the deadline this year to when five seventeen. So that means your job just stays pretty busy until mid to late. May. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'll take a crack at, at uh, some accounting this week and I don't know. We'll see. I've been talking to my accountant. Yeah. It's been, it's just been a really bad season for a whole bunch of reasons, but it, and it's not just our firm. Um, pretty much anybody that works in tax will tell you that this has been the worst year they've ever worked. You know, here, hear, hear me out on this. I almost every year file an extension. Yeah. And I, ha- I have to pay money to file an extension, and usually there's penalties. Well, how much do you have? Well, who, who, what are you paying for? I, I don't know. I don't know. It, there, there, there's, there's fees. I don't, even, I don't know what they are. Hey, hear me out, though. Let me explain something to you, though. Well, well hang on. Hear, hear, me out, hear me out. What I'm relating it to is the vaccine. <laughs> Just going to let it go kind of as long as I can, and uh, then when it's time, I'll do it. Because it's not, it's, it's not, on, my, it's not up on my priority list. That's that's all. Okay, like that's but, my defense on the on the vaccine. There, we'll do a quick little bit of tax education for you and the remaining viewers that are still sticking around <laughs> after I said tax education. <laughs> um, but an automatic extension of time to file does not cost anything. Or what, what do you mean? It, well, not not I'm not saying this year. No, I'm talking about any year. Okay. There's no there there's no filing fee for an extension to file. You don't have to pay anything. If you've got an accountant that is charging you to file an extension, find a different accountant. You shouldn't have to pay for an extension. It doesn't cost anything. It's just a transmission of a form. Now, when it comes to ex- like extension of time to file does not mean extension of time to pay. So if you're expecting that you're going to owe tax for whatever reason, then you should send in an extension payment and that money doesn't go to your accountant, it goes to the IRS. And that's you paying some amount of tax that you expect to owe. And then when you actually file, that extension payment will count towards your payments for the year. And it'll reduce any potential penalties and interest for late payment of tax or underpayment of tax. 
and associated interest. But the extension filing itself shouldn't cost anything because the IRS doesn't charge for an extension. So if you've got an accountant who does, I would recommend finding a different accountant. My right. firm, we don't charge for extension filings. <sighs> All right. I'll look into it. Maybe I don't pay. I don't, I don't, I just, again, not high on my priority list. Um, I just, I'm reading through some, some headlines here. One is incredibly intoxicated man shot, barbecued his dog. So apparently that happened. That's Where was this? Oh, hold on. Wait. Florida. Florida. <laughs> uh, was see. it Florida? Uh, let me see. It's on, it's on the New York Post. Uh, man shot and, oh, no. The man shot and barbecued his dog. Okay. And he looks pretty happy in his mug shot. Uh, had a fire pit. Talk in to his, me off the air. He had a, he had a fire pit in, uh, in his front yard. What state? Let's see. Hang on. I'm looking here. I'm looking. I'm trying to read the Northampton Township. That sounds like Long Island, right? Uh, um, well, Justin's doing Miss Blaze do, uh, asked, do I read a lot? And I don't read a lot of books, but I read a lot of news, a lot of opinion articles. And I really like watching YouTube channels that just kind of do like trivia or random facts and stuff like that. So I love like a lot of different science channels. So I'm just constantly like, I like random information, but I don't read a lot of fiction. I'll read a little bit of nonfiction here and there, but what state was this? Come on. Uh, so it looks like it could have been filled, obtained by the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, I'm still looking though. Let's see. Incredibly intoxicated man. Uh, a dog had apparently been shot in the eye prior to being badly burned. Uh, his roommate reportedly told the cops and confessed to shooting the dog in nine millimeter. This is terrible. Uh, before hiding the animal outside, cops found bullet holes in the bedroom as well as the hallway. Handgun believed to be the weapon. Uh, I guess he was setting uh, his couch on a fire with lighter fluid in his front yard. Uh, so who the hell knows? But it doesn't oh. look, look like it was in Florida. And the guy's got all this military stuff on. Definitely a military guy. Weird. We got Pennsylvania. Yeah, it was definitely in Pennsylvania. Yeah, shocking the audience. Shocking the audience, not in Florida. I'll tell you, Florida, one of the things I said before we went down was you're going to see a lot more cars on the side of the road in Florida than you do in New York. And same thing goes for uh, South Carolina. You don't have annual vehicle inspections, right? We don't have vehicle inspections, period. Yeah, so there's a lot of cars with flat tires on the side of the road. Also, it's hotter, so you have a lot of cars that overheat on the side of the road. But I was, I, I mean, everywhere, there were just cars all over the side of the road, which I just thought uh, was was absolutely wild. So, uh, especially coming from New York, like, we don't see very many cars on the side of the road. Maybe maybe one a day tops. Um, let's see. Uh Let's see. Mind blowing advances in brain tech spur push for neuro rights. That'll definitely slow slow down the brain tech industry quite a bit. N- neural rights? What, what what is that even? Dude, I don't know. I'm just I'm just sharing because I'm thinking like if you're going to have any kind of like neural link or something installed, like unless they're like shooting you with a dart gun and then like dragging you into some basement in in, in like Yonkers. How how are you going to unwittingly get your brain worked on or something like this is you're going to be consent consenting to some kind of brain operation if you're going to be part of this like as far as I'm aware they don't have brain scanner technology that they can just like point at you and you don't even know about it well more than a decade on the technology envisioned by filmmaker Christopher Nolan is likely not far off according to experts in Chile who have moved the security debate beyond burglar alarms to safeguarding the most valuable real estate people ever own their minds. Uh, The South African nation is aiming to be the first in the world to legally protect citizens, neural rights. A lawmaker is expected to pass a constitutional reform blocking technology that seeks to increase, diminish or disturb people's mental integrity without their consent. So 
Uh, yeah, but the, this is solving a problem that doesn't exist. Well, again, but yeah, but I have a feeling it's going to slow down that that the growth of that technology. No, which... it's not going to do anything for it. But hey, we might as well pass pass a law banning Martians from invading Antarctica. Oh, actually, let, I got one more uh, big news story. For How you. in the world did that trigger anything? <laughs> well, you heard about, and then and then we'll wrap. But you heard about this uh, the space ship that uh china set off space station or something they they put into orbit no apparently they put a space station in orbit and something fell it didn't make it out with it and is now in orbit but it is descending and it's going to land somewhere on somewhere on earth most likely an ocean well, most likely an ocean, but 70, 30 chance, <laughs> but, uh, but that's still not great chances. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you want to be on that topic, um, probably about three decades ago, the United States had a launch of some kind of spacecraft or whatever. And one of the boosters or whatever fell somewhere in Australia and Australia sent us a bill for like the littering or whatever. And we still haven't <laughs> paid it. Really? Yeah. You can look this up. That's a shame, man. I wish I wish we I wish we pay that stuff. You know, I put it at all right, last last thing, and then and then we'll then we'll cut the feed here. Um <clears throat> I put a, a a picture of my I had a bottle of soda last night and it had all the rings around it, it had five rings around it and the six ring on the on the soda. And uh I said I just took a picture of it and I, I put a poll out there and said, Do you cut these? And the vast majority of people, let's see if this poll's still out there. The vast majority of people do, but I was really surprised by the people that do not cut their things. So let's see, 69% yes. So I got 84 that say yes and 37 that say no. So 37 people do not cut their their soda. Uh, I don't even know what it's called. Soda plastic yeah, circle. Yeah, the six-pack holders. Yeah, I got uh, James Schmaba, Jay Him, Malatuba, D Rads, Jets Hang, Atisian New York, Damien Suppressi, Succulent Sexy Dexy, uh, Mary O'Heroin, Doria Gong, uh, Mukhtar Berry. All, all these guys don't cut Agatha. Come on, guys. How it's do you not, not that cut hard. those things? You just it's the thing you're supposed to do. All these things, I think these are big PSAs like when we were kids. Yeah. And I guess because there's now instead of having, you know, 30 channels or 10 channels or you know, we had more than three TV channels growing up, but everybody was watching the same stuff and you could, your per percentage population of viewership was a lot higher. So I feel like these PSAs carried a lot further, but I remember a ton of PSAs from when we were kids, like downed power lines. We're not having plastic bags near kids. Cause you know, they're going to put it over their head and die. Um, do you remember any other good PSAs? Um, no polluting. Well, yeah. You know what's you know what actually um kills a ton of kids every single year is uh abortion curtain lines like the lines that you use to draw curtains. No, I don't think they do. I think that was just a big PSA when we were kids. There's no, a year or two no, that it's came true because I, I I was in an airport once and I was talking with a guy who worked for like a company that made like shades and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you wouldn't believe how many people like come home to find their kid like basically hang themselves. On, like they got caught in the curtain line and just like choked themselves. That's terrible. Yeah, uh, way more than plastic bags. <laughs> did you did you check the numbers? No, I have. Oh, that's wild. That's wild. Um, all right. So on that note, uh, let's peace out. Uh, James, stay on the stay on the line. Rosh, uh, hang tight for a minute. Let me pull us offline, guys. Thank you for joining. This is episode ninety nine. Of sip talk. Oh, Miss Blaze is saying ring holder I'm, I'm for ring the holder, cans. I guess. Sure. Um, but uh, but hang you know hang tight, guys. Episode 100 coming out this Thursday. Uh, very excited for that. Thank you, guys, who we see watching on a regular basis. We appreciate all you guys so much. And uh, now that we have Rosh feeding us the comments live, it makes it much more pleasurable for us to do the podcast and interact with you guys. And hopefully, we're doing a better job responding in the comments. We're oh, trying. We try to. We, we definitely do try to. So thank you guys for the comments. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the audio podcast and go to YouTube and follow on YouTube. You get the actual fully edited podcast, the intro and the outro, and you get all the links that we put under the YouTube episode. So they're all there. 
Um, and we'll see you guys next time. So thank you for joining. All right, this is the other end. Let me know what you thought. I appreciate you coming by. I, I truly do. So thank you for making it. See you next time. I like PBR. I just got priced out of it.